Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar from the Gerhard Center webinar series, The Aftermath of COVID-19, The New Social Impact Ecosystem. Today, we're very honored to have with us Professor James Hudson, and the title of his webinar is Honorable Business. Many people believe that business is, morally, is a morally suspicious activity. The suspicion reflected in the common belief that business people need to give back to society. Is business an activity which one must atone? Is it the case that if one is successful in business, one must have violated morality somewhere along the way? In other words, are business, are people right to be suspicious of business? This talk presents a, conce a conception of business, honorable business, that does not require atonement and calls on business people to incorporate this conception of business into their professional identities. Uh, James is a John T. Ryan Jr. Professor of Business Ethics and Rex and Alex E. Martin Faculty Director of the Notre Dame Deloitte Center for Ethical Leadership in the Mendoza College of Business at the University of Notre Dame. He received his BA from the University of Notre Dame, his PhD in Philosophy from University of Chicago. Prior to Notre Dame, he taught at Wake Forest, Yeshiva University, New York University, and Georgetown. He specializes in business ethics, political economy, the history of economic thoughts, and 18th century moral uh, philosophy. His books include Adam Smith, uh, Marketplace of Life, Actual Ethics, Adam Smith, The End of Socialism, The Essential Adam Smith, Honorable Business, and The Essential David Hume. His most recent, recent book is Seven Deadly Economic Sins. His next book is The Ethics of Wealth Redistribution, forthcoming in 2022. Without much ado, James, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours, man. Thank you very much, Ali, and it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. I'm going to share my screen with you because I have some slides I would like to show you. Um, let's see if I can do that here. There. Um, I hope you can see my slides. So, uh, the topic of my talk is honorable business, um, and I'm going to try to convince you that there might be such a thing as honorable business, um, although um, there is certainly a, um, a problem in making that argument. Um, and I just show you a couple of uh, articles um, that have recently appeared about business. These are in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, first one from 2018, uh, business schools have no business in the university. Um, from the Chronicle of Higher Education in 2019, abolished the business major. Um, and then um, a book that came out from Cornell University Press in, uh, in 2019, Nothing Succeeds Like Failure, The Sad History of American Business Schools. Um, I'll show you just one uh, more study to drive home the point. Uh, this was a series of studies, the summary of a series of studies that was done recently um, in which they were polling people about their views about business. Um, and you can see, if you can tell from uh, what I've highlighted here, um, in seven studies, they found that people see business profit as necessarily in conflict with the social good. Um, so not potentially uh, in conflict with it, but necessarily in conflict with social good. Um, and um, one, of the, one of their studies shows that, th that uh, people believe that organizations are seen as doing more harm when they're labeled for-profit than for than uh, labeled non-profit. Um, so there seems to be quite a, um, a suspicion of business and business activity. So if one wanted to talk about a moral purpose of business, it seems like that might be a difficult case to make. Um, so as was mentioned, I, my PhD is in philosophy. Um, and when I first came to talk in a, uh, came to teach in a business school, one of the things that uh, I discovered that surprised me was the number of business students who were embarrassed about studying business. In fact, many of them seemed defensive about it. Uh, they didn't want to tell their friends or, um, or their colleagues that they were studying business. Sometimes they would lie about it, especially if they were in finance, they would tell them that they studied something else. Um, and for many of these students, um, they were asked, if they were asked, well, why are you studying business? It seemed as though there were only two possible answers to that the total universe of possible answers of why study business or why dedicate one's life to business were either to get a job or to make money um, and that there couldn't be anything else. Um, now, is it true that business students want to get a job or want to make money? I'm sure it is true. Um, is that true for other students, students in other majors and other programs as well? Probably. 
But still, even if that's true, it's not a particularly inspiring uh, reason to go into business. And I would say um, uh, so solely to make money is probably not a good reason to do anything in life. But I'd like to ask you to consider this analogy. Consider these two professions, medicine and business. So they are both professions. Um, in both cases, you have specialties, you have sub subspecialties. In both cases, there's technical knowledge that you need to know in order to succeed. Um, and in both cases, um, there might be, it might require um, years of experience before you're successful. And then finally, in both cases, um, if you are successful, if you're good at what you do, you might make a lot of money. Yet consider how differently those two professions are viewed in the wider culture. So no one says to the medical doctor, for example, well, now that you've made your money, you need to give back to society. But they do say that to the business profession. Business professionals often do hear, and businesses generally often do hear, that they need to give back. Well, I'd like to ask you to think about that phrase for a second. Notice that people don't say that business or business people should give. They say they should give back. But think about the meaning of that. If someone tells you, if your mother told you when, when you were a child that you need to give that back, what does that mean you've done? Well, it probably means you stole something. You took something that didn't belong to you. So if people say that business people or businesses need to give back, um, does that mean that they think that um, somewhere along the line, a successful business person or a successful uh, business must have done something wrong for which they need to atone? I think the answer is yes, that is what people think. They think um, that business people need to atone for something. They may not know exactly what you did that was wrong, but they're pretty sure that um, there is something that you did that was wrong. Well, here's my argument. Um, I think if we're going to have business schools and we're going to teach people business and we're gonna ask people or train them to dedicate their lives in business, then there should be some way of understanding business such that it's valuable in itself, not for what it might do afterwards, not for um, say charitable activity it might engage in after it's been successful, but the activity itself should be valuable um, consider that, um, think about other, um, other vices people might engage in. We don't say to a thief, well, um, as long as some of what you stole, you give to charity, um, we tell this, the thief, stop stealing. We don't say to a murderer, it's fine as long as some of the people you kill are bad people. We say, stop killing. So I think something similar, we should say something similar about business. If it's the case, after we've examined all the arguments in favor of business or against business, um, all the arguments in favor of a market economy or against a market economy, if at the end of all that, we think that business really is the sort of thing that people need to make up for, they need to give back to atone for, then I think we shouldn't uh, ask them to give back. I think, in fact, we should say, don't do it in the first place. But what that means is that if we are going to continue to, um, to teach business, to have business schools, then I think it's incumbent on us to give an answer to this question. Why business? What's the moral purpose of business? So um, what I'd like to do tonight is give you something of just a sketch of a way of understanding business and its connection to morality. So let me first uh, start with uh, Aristotle. So Aristotle argued that human beings, maybe um, uh, alone or uniquely among creatures on earth, have what he called a hierarchy of purposes or ends. What that means is that they have, um, they have near-term goals, things they want to accomplish today or tomorrow. Um, but if you ask why they want to accomplish those goals, it's because of intermediate goals, things they want to accomplish in a week or a month or a year. Um, and if you ask why they want to accomplish those goals, well, you keep doing this and so on and so on until we finally get to what Aristotle called an ultimate or final end. That's the end for the sake of which you do everything else. Um, well, what is that end? According to Aristotle, that ultimate or final end or goal or purpose for human beings is what he called eudaimonia. That's just a transliteration of the Greek term eudaimonia. It's hard to translate into English. It's often translated as happiness, um, but it doesn't mean contentment or pleasure. It means um, a life well and fully lived. So here's the idea. If you imagine yourself, if today, and I invite all of you to do this who are listening, and imagine yourself at the end of your life. So think of yourself at being 120 years old and you're looking back on the life you led. What kind of life do you want to have led such that you would say that was a life worth having been led? If you come to an answer to that question, that gives you some conception of what a eudaimonic or truly or genuinely happy life could be. 
Well, in order to achieve that, then what you do is when you imagine what that end of um, that final goal is um, that would enable you to have a, a positive end of life um, judgment of your own life, then what you do is you just reverse engineer. So then you ask yourself, well, what do I need to be doing in 20 years to enable that to happen? And what do I need to be doing in 10 years? And in one year, what do I need to be doing today? So achieving eudaimonia requires a rationally ordered moral life that connects all of those ends, connects the things we're doing today to our intermediate ends, to our longer term ends, and then finally to our ultimate end. Okay, so with that in mind, I'd like to invite you to think about this in connection to business. And I wanna suggest something similar, that there's a similar hierarchy of value or hierarchy of purpose that might apply to business. So let's start at the highest level. Um, um, what would be the final or ultimate social end? So my suggestion is, this is I'm just gonna give you five steps here, but I think we, would, we all want, wherever we are on the political or economic spectrum, everybody wants a just and humane society. Um, we, may, we might define just and humane society slightly differently, but for, the purpose, for our purposes right now, let's leave it uh, relatively open and allow for different kinds of definitions, but let me get a little more specific. Um, so if we all want a just and humane society, um, it's also the case that such a society, a just and humane society, depends on a variety of institutions. Now, those are political institutions, economic institutions, maybe moral or religious or even cultural institutions, if culture is an institution. But there are some institutions that contribute to a just and humane society and others that detract from it. So just and humane society will depend on a specific signature of institutions, of public social institutions. And now here I'm gonna get a little bit more specific and a little bit more controversial. Um, I would argue that those among those institutions is a properly functioning market economy. That's not the only institution that's required um, to support a just and humane society, but it is one of them. But of course, I'm sure you're thinking, well, what exactly does, uh, is a properly functioning market economy? What does the word properly mean there? Two more steps. Second to last step is that a properly functioning market economy is based on what I will call, and we'll explain a little bit um, more about what I mean, but I will call honorable business. Okay, and so now I'm sure your question is, well, what exactly is honorable business, say, as opposed to dishonorable business? Honorable business is when industries or firms or individuals, you and I, are creating genuine value. And what I mean by that is making not only our own, but others' lives genuinely better. So here's my suggestion, that business people and firms that are engaged in creating genuine value are actually contributing to this hierarchy of purpose. Um, and what they should be able to do is to explain whatever their particular job is, they're working for a particular company, they have a particular role within a particular company. If they're asked what they're doing at that company, I hope they say, I'm contributing to a just and humane society. Um, and if uh, they're asked, well, what do you mean by that? They say, well, give me just a couple of minutes and I'll explain it to you. I'm creating genuine value, um, which just is honorable business as part of a properly functioning market economy that is one of the institutions that supports a just and humane society. And if we're doing this right, if one is doing this right, and here's a little uh, test for, for yourself, um, if you are doing this right, then there's one way and one way only in which you can improve your own life, and that is by improving other people's lives. Okay, now um, let me take a slight digression. And uh, when I talk to students about this, often I get the question, well, why does this matter? Why are we talking about this purpose, this uh, moral hierarchy and the um, ultimate purpose of business? Well, one reason is to consider this, consider what's called the great enrichment. What you're looking at there, that's quite a graph, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, what you're looking at there is total wealth production worldwide from year one to today. Um, and that is in constant international dollars. So we're, um, we're discounting for changes in currency, et cetera. But you can see there that for almost all of that period, I don't know if you can see my cursor there at the bottom, but for almost all of this period, there's very little change. Um, and not only is it, is it extremely consistent, it's also extremely low. Um, a great deal of poverty, not very much wealth, we start to see a little bit of an uptick and especially around 1800 or so, things absolutely take off. Let me show you one other way to think about this and I'll give you a, a data going a little bit further back. Now what I have, what I'm showing you here is per capita um, wealth. So this is again, all the wealth created in the world 
divided by the number of people alive at the time. And you can see we have two different, um, two different lines here, a blue line and a red line. The blue line is from Angus Madison, who did a heroic job in calculating um, total wealth per capita back to year one. The red line comes from uh, Brad DeLong, who is an economist at the University of California at Berkeley, who calculates it back 12,000 years ago. Um, but you can see that is quite a hockey stick, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Now, if you are a social scientist, uh, what's the interesting part of that graph? Well, it's not what went on from 8,000 to 7,000 BC or from 3,000 to 2,000. What's interesting is this. What changed? Something dramatic changed. Um, and it has led to now more wealth in real terms than has ever existed in human history. So you and I are blessed um, and lucky to live in a time when there is more overall wealth in the world than any other human generation, generation of human, human beings have ever enjoyed. Okay, now when you think about that graph, the question that I'm sure comes to mind is, well, what caused the change? What caused that sudden uh, increase? Here's my answer to this, and I will, uh, for full disclosure, I will admit that there are various answers to this. There is no consensus about it. There is consensus that the change happened. What there is not consensus about is what exactly led to the change. Um, but I want to make a suggestion. Here's my suggestion that what principally led to the change was, was a shift in moral attitude. And I can illustrate this by um, asking you to consider the two ways that you can get something from someone else that you might want. Um, so suppose you have something that I would like. It could be anything. It could be um, a laptop. It could be your labor. Maybe I want you to work for me. Um, let's suppose it's an iPhone. Um, if you have a smartphone, an iPhone, and I would really like to have your iPhone. Well, there are two ways I could get it from you, aren't there? Um, one way is I could steal it from you. I could just take it from you without your permission. Maybe I defraud, it, uh, defraud you out of it, promise to pay you some money, and then, don't, and then you give me the phone, and then I don't actually pay you. Um, all of those ways we can call extraction. And extraction is defined by two key features. One, um, it benefits one person, at the expense of another. So if I steal your iPhone from you, that's plus one iPhone for me, minus one iPhone for you, plus one plus minus one is zero. So yes, I've benefited, but at your expense, and there's been no net increase in prosperity. We haven't both benefited, it's just me benefiting at your expense. So the first aspect of extraction is that it benefits only one party to the exchange at the expense of the other. The second uh, feature of it is that it is involuntary. If I steal from you, you didn't consent to it. You didn't give permission to it. I did it without your consent. So what's the other way I might get your iPhone from you? I could extract it from you. The other way I would call cooperation. And what I mean by cooperation is just the mirror opposite of extraction. In that case, what I'm doing is I'm making you an offer that you are free to accept or decline. Suppose I offer you some money for your iPhone. You and I agree on a price. I give you the money. You give me the iPhone. Now, note what happened in that exchange. Um, first of all, it was voluntary, mutually voluntary. I didn't force you to exchange, you didn't force me to exchange. And second of all, there is a positive sum. It is a positive sum exchange. In other words, if you didn't think you benefited from that exchange, you would have said, no, thank you and gone elsewhere. If I didn't think I benefited from that exchange, I would have said, no, thank you and gone elsewhere. So the fact that both of us said yes means that both of us must have, from our individual uh, perspectives, believed we benefited from that exchange. So that means that there's positive value for you, positive value for me, positive plus positive is positive. So here are the two kinds, the two ways of, um, of getting something from somebody else. Extraction, as I mentioned, which includes theft, slavery, imperialism, col uh, colonization, uh, fraud, and then cooperation which is voluntary exchange partnership. And it includes what I call the opt-out option. That's the right to say, no, thank you. Someone makes you an offer or a proposal. You have an, um, you, if you have the right to say, no, thank you, then you enjoy an opt-out option. So my suggestion is that what began, what um, changed and what led to that great increase in prosperity is that people began to believe that extraction was morally unacceptable and that cooperation was morally praiseworthy. In other words, people began to believe, more and more people in more and more places began to believe that merely stealing from others was morally unacceptable, and that the way you should deal with other people was by 
voluntary exchange partnership and association and respecting their opt-out option. If they say, no, thank you, then you have to respect it. Okay, now let me ask you two questions. I guess we could call this something like a quiz, but um, um, since we're um, in many different places in the world, I'll, um, I'll give you the answers. But here's my first question about this. Which of those two is more moral, extraction or cooperation? Um, now, I hope the answer is obvious. I think I believe that cooperation is more moral, although I will point out if it seems obvious to you, it hasn't seemed obvious to many people and throughout much of, much of human history. Um, here's a second question. Which of the two, extraction or cooperation, leads to increasing prosperity? Well, by a stroke of spectacularly good luck, it's the same one. Um, so I would suggest that cooperation is not only more moral, but it is the only way that leads to, it's the only way to exchange, associate, partner, transact with other people um, such that both parties or all parties to the transaction benefit. It leads to net benefit. So here's my suggestion. Honorable business, what I would like to call honorable business, is cooperative business. It is engaging only in voluntary exchange that is positive sum plus just a wee bit more, and I'll come back to the wee bit more in just a second. So let me be uh, clear. What is honorable business? The first part of it, given what I've argued, is no extractive behavior ever. And this has to be internalized into one's own character. So not only when people are watching, um, but as part of the way each of us as individuals commits to dealing with other people, never to engage in extractive behavior where I benefit myself at other people's expense, and if you think of medicine, you might think of the Hippocratic Oath. The Hippocratic Oath in medicine is the one that says, first, do no harm. Extract the behavior causes or imposes harm or cost or injury on other people who are unwilling. So never benefit oneself at another's unwilling expense. And then second, what follows from that is cooperative behavior only. And in order to do that, we have to treat all parties with equal respect for their autonomy and their dignity as human beings, and we have to respect their opt-out option. And it also means that we have to honor our promises. If we make a promise, we have to honor it, even when no one's looking, even when no one would know that we broke the promise. Um, it becomes part of our character as human beings, our moral character, that if we make a promise, we'll keep it. That's the only way I think we can truly respect other people as um, our equals in human dignity. Then third and finally, I think we have to make a positive commitment. And the positive commitment is to provide only genuine value to others. And I call that a two-way street. And what I mean by that is that we shouldn't engage in transactions. So being mutually voluntary is necessary, but not yet sufficient um, grounds for us to transact or associate with other people. I think we are called actually to, make, to ask ourselves whether the transaction is genuinely improving the lives of other people. There are many voluntary transactions we might engage in that don't actually um, benefit others and might not benefit ourselves. So we have to ask ourselves, we have to employ our moral judgment and say, is this really a genuine value to other people? Is it genuinely improving their lives? And is my life being improved um, at the same time? So my suggestion is that honorable business so defined as I have defined it here, is positive sum, it is win-win for both parties to the exchange, but in fact, it's win-win-win. It's not only benefiting me and you, if we are the parties to the transaction, both of us benefit. It's also benefiting society um, in several ways, and I'll come back to that in just a second. Before I do so, and before I close, let me, um, let me entertain one objection, and that has to do with inequality. So suppose you have an economy that allows for cooperative exchange, as I've described it, um, and that punishes or forbids extractive exchange, as I've described it, is it the case that in such a society you might have inequality? Might you have wealth inequality? The answer to that is yes. <laughs> you might have wealth inequality, um, but um, is that something we should worry about? Now, let me give you a little thought experiment about this. So should we worry about wealth inequality? Um, Consider two people, and I'm not gonna tell you who these two people are just yet, um, but I will tell you this fact about them. There are two people, A and B. A is much wealthier than B. Let's say that A has 100 times as much wealth as B, so a lot wealthier than B. A is a lot wealthier than B. Now, let me ask you, just for your consideration, think about this. Um, do you think that a society in which one person could be worth 100 times as much, could have 100 times as much wealth as another person, must be an unjust society? 
Um, do you think it must indicate a failure of justice or perhaps a failure of social justice? Well, while you're thinking about that, let me tell you who my A and B are. Here is my A. I don't know whether you recognize that person or not, uh, but that's Bill Gates, uh, the founder of Microsoft. Um, what is he worth? He's worth currently a little over 100 billion American dollars. Um, so he's extremely wealthy. And I suppose there he's thanking, uh, maybe he's thanking God for the, for the fact that he lives in America. I'm not sure what he's doing. Um, well, who's the person that we might consider who is worth only one hundredth as much as, um, as Bill Gates? There are many people we might consider. I'll just give you one famous American. I don't know whether you uh, recognize him. That's Michael Jordan, one of the greatest uh, basketball players uh, in history. He's worth only one 180, uh, sorry, one 82nd as much. In other words, he has um, only one 82nd as much wealth as Bill Gates. Um, I'll give you one other person that you might consider who's approximately one 100th as wealthy as Bill Gates. Um, I don't know whether you recognize her. That's Kim Kardashian West. Um, so both Michael Jordan and Kim Kardashian West are extremely poor relative to Bill Gates. Um, on the other hand, by absolute standards, they're very wealthy indeed. So what, what does that show? Here's what I think that shows. That when we're evaluating the morality of wealth inequality, I think we have to ask, how did the wealthier pre person or how did the wealthier people get their wealth? Did they get it through extraction? Did they get it through theft? fraud, colonization, et cetera? Um, were they, um, did they benefit themselves at other people's expense? Or did they get it through cooperation, through mutually voluntary transactions that led to positive sum benefit for both or all parties to the transaction? I think that matters when we're trying to determine whether the inequality is moral or not. And then of course, there's that second question too. We also have to think about the absolute quality, not the relative quality. So Michael Jordan and Kim Kardashian West are, are extremely poor relative to Bill Gates, but by absolute standards, meaning objective or world standards, they're extremely wealthy. So I think it would be um, absurd to suggest that we should redistribute some of Bill Gates's wealth to Michael Jordan and Kim Kardashian West, since they're only worth as much, uh, uh, only a fraction as much as Bill Gates. But those are extreme cases, of course. Um, so are there people in, say, in the United States um, who, are worth um, not only 100 times as much, but 1,000 times as much as others? Yes, there are. How about 10,000 times? Yes, there are. 100,000 times? Yes, even that. We can even double and even more than that. Consider someone who is worth only one 250,000th of Bill Gates' wealth. Um, now, that's a person that you might think um, has an absolute quality of life that must be very difficult, very poor, maybe a miserable person who's worth only two, one 250,000th of Bill Gates' wealth. Well, who is that person? Uh, that's, that's me. <laughs> um, actually, uh, I'm not quite. I rounded up um, just for the sake of the, uh, of the example. Um, but what is that supposed to show? That even a person worth only one 250,000th of um, Bill Gates' wealth is still by world standards, um, um, and especially by those historical standards that I was showing you before, uh, much wealthier than the vast majority of humanity in, in human history. Now, what does that show? Um, this is the question I would leave you with. Um, suppose you could get rid of one thing in the world, but only one thing. Would you get rid of poverty or inequality? Um, now, which, in other words, which of those two things do you think is the greater cause of misery in human life? In my view, I'll give you my opinion, I'm happy to hear yours, but my opinion is poverty. Poverty is the, is the cause of far greater human suffering and misery in life. And if that's more important than inequality, if we could so solve only one of those, then what's the antidote to poverty? The antidote to poverty is prosperity. So let's relate this finally, and I'll come to my conclusion about honorable business. So why should a person engage in business? Um, I think a person should be um, open to engaging in honorable business because since honorable business is cooperative, it treats people with dignity and respect. Remember the opt-out option. You make offers to other people that they're free to decline if they so choose. But honorable, honorable business also seeks to create mutual benefit. That's the positive sum transaction. And because of that, it leads to increasing overall prosperity. Um, now, there are a couple of qualifications I would add there. Only genuine value. So mutually, this is what I mentioned before, mutually voluntary is, is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So we have to ask ourselves, 
is this voluntary transaction we're thinking about engaging in actually benefiting, actually providing value um, to, in other people's lives? Um, and there is a way to think about waste as a moral failure. So each of us has a unique signature of gifts, talents, um, abilities, and skills. Um, we have opportunities. If we don't use those opportunities to improve not only our own, but others' lives simultaneously, then I think we're actually leaving prosperity on the table. There's prosperity we could create for other people that we're not. So to, um, to this question, why should a purpose, what is the purpose or end um, for which a person should gauge, engage in business? Uh, my suggestion is to use one's time, one's talent, and one's treasure to benefit oneself and others simultaneously. And in that way, I think you can respect both prosperity and morality, but only if business is honorable as I have defined it. And then as I've defined it, is it possible that, moder that honorable business might indeed be a moral calling? And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I will say thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, discussion. Uh, when you were talking about cooperation, I could not help but think of the classical game theory, the prisoner's dilemma, especially when yes. you were talking about cooperation. Yes. I mean, it's simple just for the audience. I mean, you have two people, uh, they are in prison, and they have a choice either to confess on each other's or not to confess at all, both of them, or one of them betrays the other. Now, the interesting part is that in most of the variants, if you betray, you actually win more, which yes. is a classical business model. I mean, people, when they talk about cooperation, this is the, the archetype model that they, they present to you, which sends, sends a subtle message that betrayal is better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or don't, I mean, I mean, of course, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it's, I mean, when you talk about cooperation, it's, there's a very important part about trust. Oh, absolutely. I just want to yeah. take your opinion about this before I, I, I have more, I mean, other, other comments and other questions. But I just want to get your, 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 your take on this. Uh, yes, so uh, it's a great question. Um, so in the prisoners, in, in the prisoner, in the classic prisoner's dilemma, the dominant strategy is, as you say, um, to betray because that get, that uh, creates greater benefit to you. That's also um, the dominant strategy for your partner, um, and because of that, you end up in a um, in a suboptimal with a suboptimal result that neither party wanted. Um, it, what's not ideal for either party, and you're giving up some benefit that you could otherwise have had if you don't trust one another. Um, so what I would suggest, so, um, and there's a great deal as, as I'm sure you're aware, there's a great deal of discussion about um, how to deal with prisoners' dilemmas um, or these kinds of situations and also um, how frequent they are in human, um, in human society or in human uh, social interactions. Um, but the one thing I would say about that in relation to business is that um, the, the prisoners' dilemma gets that negative result. In other words, people are encouraged or they're incentivized to betray in large part because it is a one-off um, decision. In other words, um, it's as if this is the only decision they'll ever make and they'll never interact with one another again or never interact with other people again. They don't develop a reputation for being a person who either can be trusted or cannot be trusted and they aren't able to develop trust for one another. Those ways, I think, distinguish it from um, what can go on in what I'm calling honorable business. Because in honorable business, you don't only have one customer. Um, there is never only one transaction. You're engaging in multiple transactions with multiple co uh, customers, clients, <laughs> employees, et cetera, um, over long periods of time. In that way, what you can do is you develop a reputation, which can be a very powerful um, um, uh, signal to others about whether you should be um, trusted or not, um, and it can be a very powerful disciplining factor so that people will, um, are encouraged to think about not only themselves in this one spot transaction, um, but themselves and others in longer term transactions. Now, I mean, over, over a longer term. Um, now, I still take your point. Um, there, will be, um, there will be cases in anybody's life, business or otherwise, in which you can benefit yourself at another person's expense. Um, and so um, you will be incentivized to do that. And part of my call for honorable business is to 
think not only about um, oneself in these transactions, because that can be an extractive exchange, but rather think about the overall purpose of a business, which is generating prosperity in a just and humane society. And once you raise your sights a little bit, as it were, you raise your eyes and look at the, that larger purpose, I think that can give, I hope that can give some uh, moral motivation to, in, to seek out and engage only in cooperative um, exchanges and transactions. Lovely. Uh, I also liked in the very beginning when you start with the parallel between business, uh, honorable business, and morality for individuals. Uh, and, but then you put this interesting statement where you put the proper functioning market economy yes. hinges on honorable business. Yes. The parallel for it is proper functioning society would hinge on uh, honorable citizens. Yes, exactly. Well, you only need critical mass <laughs> of it. I mean, but, but in really, I mean, in reality, is there a role for governance? Is there a role for a rule of law? Is there oh, a absolutely. Rule for yes. Public pressure, or you just leave it to the goodness of will, goodness of people, or goodness of, of, of corporations and assume that they all going to behave? Yeah, no, um, it's a good question. So I think there are two parts of that, and they're both, um, you, you, you see, you're seeing already um, some of the arguments that I would make if we had more time, or um, if you took a look at my book, you would see these. So Yes, I think there is an analogy between honorable business and being an honorable person. Um, so I think that's absolutely right. Um, and your question is, um, what's the role of the government or what's the role of the state um, at a minimum? I'll tell you what I think is the minimum necessary um, is to um, punish and prevent extraction um, and to allow institutions that, allow, that um, enable people to benefit from cooperative transactions. So What's that going to mean? I think that's going to mean you, you need, at a moment, uh, at a minimum, um, protections for um, for persons, bodily persons, so that they can't be killed or enslaved or captured or um, um, or molested. You also need uh, um, institutions that protect people's property, um, that give them property rights, allow people to own property, and protect that against invasion or theft or trespass without permission. Um, and then I would say, in addition to that, maybe the third main thing that um, I would say the that's required is for the government to protect voluntary promises and contracts um, and agreements. So that when people enter into transactions, they, they uh, create contracts for partnership or association. Um, if they've done it voluntarily, they need to be held to those contracts. And if they violate them, then there needs to be some mechanism to punish them. So I think all of those things are necessary. Um, within a structure like that, then I think people can begin to use their own initiative to discover ways of engaging with others entrepreneurially um, for mutual benefit, but they need those protections before they're able to do so. Lovely. I'm gonna take questions from the audience. Uh, I'm please, gonna yes. start with uh, Vinny Charma, please, Vinny. Uh, uh, yes. Uh... It was, it was a wonderful talk, uh, Professor. So my basic question is that, you know, as far as, uh, I mean, uh, as far as, uh, uh, I mean, the conditions are concerned in the present, you know, we are seeing a lot of, you know, despite higher education and a lot of, you know, business uh, uh, MBAs and a lot of, you know, these uh, uh, glamorous, you know, degrees coming up, uh, universities coming up, we are still seeing, you know, a lot of monopolies uh, coming up into the, you know, uh, uh, I mean, as far as, you know, these, uh, uh, I mean, business environment is concerned, a lot of oligopolies and we are seeing a race up to the bottom, you know, as far as the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, profit, a lot of over profiteering firms, a lot, lot more focused on, you know, I mean, uh, 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 financial repression, you know, and uh, in fact, uh, as we are seeing, you know, uh, there are a lot of evasion of taxes and uh, uh, and a lot of, you know, these uh, oligopolies and monopolies are a lot more, you know, focused on uh, basically, you know, trying to, uh, I mean, uh, trying to you know uh, uh, exploit capitalism as as much as possible you know uh, in the in the name of you know creating jobs etc but they basically create a lot more inequality you know so basically they are not concerned with the environment also they are neither concerned with the you know i mean uh, uh, with the i mean equality or with the uh, rise of real wages etc you know and everything is getting you know we are seeing the you know a lot of billionaires uh, get, get coming up you know even after this pandemic despite you know i mean a lot of you know i mean what you call uh, a pain as far as you know the entire society is concerned you know and and the governments are running short of ideas as far as fiscal monetary uh, fiscal measures 
measures are concerned, monetary measures are concerned, you know, everything is basically targeted towards, uh, I mean, large firms, you know, and they get bigger and bigger, you know. So what exactly is the, uh, I mean, the, I mean, the business model that can be, I mean, uh, you know, as far as future is concerned, you know, can be, you know, uh, can be, I mean, uh, what you call, uh, uh, I, uh, I mean, uh, can be uh, thought of, you know, so that, you know, uh, the, the lot of, you know, the profits are basically uh, distributed fairly, you know, because even with the Biden administration, uh, you know, uh, coming up with global MNCs tax of 15%, you know, uh, still, you know, we are seeing, you know, a lot of, you know, these uh, ev evasion and a lot of, you know, these big accountancy firms, uh, tax firms, you know, everything is going to get, you know, everything will be a mess, you know, as far as uh, uh, fair distribution is concerned, you know, because of which, you know, future will be in crisis because the uh, worker health will be in crisis uh, the uh, firms automation and a lot of what technologies are coming up and they are going to be impacting you know a lot more lot more what you call you know uh, job opportunities and uh, fair opportunities so what is at least the you know solution for that because the i mean money is going into the stock markets but it is not uh, you know coming into the you know uh, basically the real economy because of which it looks very good you know that okay you know that the i mean the share, share market is doing well you know and the uh, i mean investors are doing well p firms are doing well everyone is making money but still you know we are still seeing you know that that uh, i mean everything is happening at the cost of you know uh, economy because the food prices are going up you know oil prices are going up so uh, how do you deconstruct that you know decompose that sort of uh, you know this sort of you know uh, volatile situation so thanks uh, wow. Well, that was an awful lot of things. I tried to jot down some of the concerns you mentioned, oligopolies, uh, financial depressions, monopolies, exploitation, inequality, environment, fiscal policy, um, quite a lot of things. Um, so I, I, I don't think I can probably address all of those, um, but maybe I would um, ju address a, just a couple of them. So the, the model that uh, I'm offering for that I, or that I was proposing for honorable business um, is uh, it, it presumes um, a, an environment in which, um, along the lines of what I was saying um, to Ali's question a little bit earlier, it, pre it presumes an environment in which um, there are protections for things like persons, property, and promises. Um, if you don't have that, then, uh, then um, the idea of increasing prosperity, and especially increasing generalized prosperity, um, then th that certainly endangers it. There's no question about that. Um, but with things like oligopolies and monopolies, um, it turns out you know we, we've done quite a bit of investigation, empirical investigation into monopolies. So monopolies are things that obviously occur in market economies. They occur in all economies, um, but they're exceedingly rare if they're natural monopolies. And what I mean by that is almost all monopolies, and there are some economists who think that literally all monopolies that we have observed in history um, have been created by governments. Now, why do I point that out? Because that actually is an example of extractive behavior. If you give a special charter um, or special subsidies or special considerations or protections from competition to a particular company or maybe a family or even an industry, um, what that's really doing is providing some benefit to them at the expense of others. So that would fall under um, what I would call extraction and would not fall under what I call cooperation. Um, and I would say maybe one last thing in the interest, I know there are other people who have questions as well. Um, so I, I apologize that I'm not able to address all of the things you, um, you raise. Um, you know, many of them are, these are things that are just difficulties endemic to a fallen world. So I don't think there's any perfect system. There will always be problems. Um, and um, the field that I work in, I uh, call it political economy. Um, and what we do in political economy typically is we understand that um, because human beings are imperfect and always will be imperfect, um, the, the question of establishing a perfect system is not on offer. That's impossible. So what we try to do is to get the best, we look at second bests and we compare actually available alternatives to see which might be relatively better or maybe um, the least bad among competing alternatives. Um, but I would mention one, one other thing and that's about uh, the environment. So you, um, you, mentioned, you, you raised the uh, question about the environment and the, and the extent to which businesses um, or maybe honorable businesses, if you accept my term, um, would um, address their attention to environments. Um, we tend to think when we ask a question about like that, about the environment, so this is a, this is a very large problem um, and the effect that any one business can have on the environment is uh, relatively small given um, the scale of the problem. Uh, nevertheless, we tend to think that um, the only way to address that or to get businesses say to um, be, um, uh, to engage in more uh, sustainable practices or more environmentally friendly practices 
The only way to do that is through regulation or laws that require them to do so. Um, and those can be effective. They can also be counterproductive in some ways if they're constructed in, uh, in hasty or not very thoughtful ways. Um, but there is another way that we can encourage businesses to do that. And this is something I would um, offer for your consideration. And that is what I would call back end discipline. What I mean by that is um, not the front end discipline of uh, law regulation, but back end, meaning what consumers do, what clients do, what employees do. So businesses are very sensitive because they have to be in order to survive to customers, to clients um, and to their wishes. So if concern for the environment, um, sustainable business practices, et cetera, if those are things that matter to individual human beings, to us, um, then those should be reflected in the choices we make, who we buy for, from, who we don't buy from, who we're willing to work for, who we're not willing to work for. And those kinds of choices that we would make as individuals can have a great deal of influence on companies. And I think that's actually what we're seeing. So many companies, many multinational companies and many American companies um, currently engage in environmental, environmentally sustainable practices that go well beyond what they're required to do by law. Um, and you might ask, well, why do they do that? Well, I think it's responding to consumer sentiment and consumer demand. That's what we want. And so they're trying to figure out ways to give us what we want. To, so in other words, to benefit themselves, but only by benefiting others. And that, that requires them to pay attention to what we want as well. Uh, I'm going to take a question from uh, Abdurrahman Hegazi. Would you unmute yourself and talk, please? Abdurrahman. Yes. Uh, basically, my question is: um, is, a well, uh, is, is a wealth tax uh, a reasonable approach to solve the issue regarding inequality? As for example, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders is a huge advocate for the the concept that there should be no billionaires in the world, like uh, Jeff Bezos, for example, and no people should have that amount of money uh, for their own. So uh, isn't, is it a reasonable approach or not? Uh, thank you for the question. So um, um, I think the question of whether uh, billionaires are good for the economy or billionaires are bad for the economy, which I take it as Bernie Sanders' question. So his, his claim is that billionaires are bad for the economy. What I would say is it depends on what the, how the billionaire became a billionaire. So billionaire, people who become billionaires, who become extremely wealthy um, through extraction, they're bad for the economy. They're bad for everybody. Um, and ultimately also for themselves because they're imperiling the institutions that enable generalized prosperity. On the other hand, um, people who become wealthy by providing goods and services to other people through cooperative and what I call honorable business, um, then I think there's much less cause for moral concern. One thing I would point out, and maybe this is something you might be uh, interested to investigate. Um, so a Nobel laureate economist named William Nordhaus um, a few years ago, tried to calculate, um, he looked at the wealth created by, by wealthy entrepreneurs, um, and he tried to calculate how much of the wealth that they're creating actually is captured by themselves versus how much of it is going to other people, to consumers, to other people in society. Um, and his estimate was that 2.2% of it is captured by the entrepreneur himself. 2.2%. So the other 97.8% is given, is um, accrued by or captured by um, consumers um, and uh, citizens generally. So if you think about, you know, Steve Jobs and uh, Apple. Um, so Steve Jobs was a billionaire when he died. Um, that's a lot of money. Um, how much value or benefit did his innovations, uh, iPhones, et cetera, how much value did they provide for other people who use those iPhones? So the estimate looks like it's um, the, the vast majority of that goes to other people. So for that reason, what I would say is um, we should be very careful in saying, let's get rid of billionaires because that includes people like, um, uh, would include people like Steve Jobs. Um, and if we had no Amazon, think about how much, um, how many jobs, et cetera, that, that, that we would lose. Um, and the real question, the moral question I would say is how did the billionaire get the money? Um, and again, if it's through positive sum transactions, then I think there's much less cause for concern than if it was through extractive zero sum transactions. Thank you. Uh, George uh, Zompolis, please unmute and ask your question, sir. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Augustine. Uh, one you. thing that kept coming on the back of my head constantly was the content deontology 
and specifically the Hemant formulation. Anyways, my question to you is, under your opinion, in an ever rapidly and exponentially evolving world, especially after the COVID pandemic, what is the humanity's primary focus and how could this be achieved, taking into account all the limitations of the real world? Uh, basically, where should the conversations be focused upon? Um, it's a good question. It's a very hard question to answer. And, um, and I'm going to um, sidestep it a bit, and I apologize for that, because um, I don't think there's any one solution or any one way that people can benefit others or benefit the world. And I think um, the way that any, any given individual, say you yourself, if you're wondering what's the thing you should be focusing on um, to provide, as I was trying to describe it or trying to argue for, a genuine value or gen genuine benefit to others, um, that's going to depend on a, on a range of factors, including what are the political institutions uh, where you live, um, what are the economic opportunities where you live, and those, vary, those are very different in, very different in different places around the world. Um, but one sort of general claim I would suggest is I think it can be a mistake and a mistake because it can be a distraction to ask ourselves, how can I solve the world's problems? There is no set, there is no single problem that the world faces. Um, and if you say, well, I want to solve, for example, suppose you say I want to solve global poverty. Um, we've had lots of plans um, for solving gl global poverty. They almost all fail um, as plans. Um, partly because none of them can actually account for all of the particularity, the individual history, the changing circumstances of many individuals in very different circumstances around the world. So what I would suggest just as a, a, a general proposal is to think not about those large scale plans, but rather think about some problem that you yourself see, observe, and know something about, and ask yourself, how can I solve that problem? And if each of us think about individual problems that we see in our own communities or with our own uh, friends, families, fellow citizens, um, that we can address even uh, one problem incrementally, what that means is that um, as all of us do this, we're solving more and more individual problems. And I think that's the way that we've been able to create so much wealth in the world um, in the last 200 years, is not by any one person saying, I'm going to solve large scale problems, but by millions and now billions of people looking for individual problems that they can solve in ways that are mutually beneficial. Super. I, I have four questions. Uh, if, uh, if we start taking them, uh, do you mind if we spill over a little bit uh, after the uh, hour mark? No, that's fine. Okay. I'm going to take questions from in this order. Shadwa, uh, Atif Ahmed, Noah Abdul Hamid, and uh, the comment from Mohammed uh, Bohiji. So we start with Shadwa. Shadwa, by the way, is, uh, is just graduated from Notre Dame last year with the oh, master. Oh, that's great. Congratulations. Shadwa. Please. Thank you, Professor Otteson. Yeah, I was about to say that's always great to hear someone from the alma mater and go Irish. Go um, Irish. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, my question is, um, do you see a role of honorable businesses beyond just not being extractive or like being collaborative? And like, do you see them being enabling, redistributive or even retributive? Because businesses for a, lo for a long time has been really extractive. I mean, even some of the examples you mentioned, like Amazon or Apple, there are concerns about how they, like their the labor rights in their organizations or like the kind of natural resources they use or uh, the amount of taxes they, they pay. So like, do you see a role for businesses beyond just being good to themselves, but like actually being good to the society? Uh, yes, in fact, I think that's, um, that's um, a, an integral component of what I mean by honorable business. So what I would say is, um, the, the refraining from injuring or causing harm, et cetera, to others, I think that's the first step. It's the necessary um, step. Uh, so before you do anything else, you have to first um, respect uh, justice with respect to these things of other people's persons and their property and their promises, et cetera. So you don't impose costs or, harms on, uh, or harm on others uh, without their permission, without their consent. That's the first step. Um, but I think we're called to do much more than that. And so uh, since you're a Notre Dame person, I'll, um, I'll take the liberty of using some uh, Notre Dame language. What I would say is um, uh, Pope, Benedict, Pope Benedict wrote about, um, in Caritas and Veritate, he wrote about charity beyond justice. 
So the first step and what I, what I interpret that, how I would interpret that and apply it to this is to say, yes, the first step is we don't, we never engage in injustice towards others, meaning um, uh, positive action to make other people worse off. That's the first step. And we can demand that and should demand that from absolutely everybody. But the next step is to take an honest look at ourselves um, and say, well, we're amply, we have blessings and skills and abilities and maybe also resources. Um, what's the best use so that I can put all of that to, to benefit not only myself, but genuinely benefit others? So I think we're actually um, called to engage in positive seeking out of ways that we can benefit others beyond just not harming them. Um, and I think um, to, to fully qualify as um, not just um, an honorable person, I think that's true in, uh, in our personal lives as well, but also as an honorable business is to ask that. Um, and that's really the criterion on which to judge businesses. Of course, yes, they should never engage in injustice, uh, meaning you know, violate, violating these kinds of rights of individuals. But in addition to that, given the resources, limitations, opportunities, constraints, et cetera, that they have, um, what genuine value, what benefit are they providing to others? Thank you, uh, Atif. Thank please. you. Atif, uh, Ahmed, would you yeah. unmute yourself, please? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so happy to um, to attend um, this interesting webinar. Actually, I always see that the power abuse is one of the most important obstacles in building honorable businesses. So my question is, how can we deal with the power abuse phenomenon uh, to maintain honorable businesses? Thank you so much. Uh, could, could I ask you just to repeat part of your question? I didn't quite get it. What did you say was the, uh, yeah. was the biggest challenge to honorable business? Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I always see that the power of use is one of uh, the most important uh, obstacles in building the honorable businesses. So it's uh, my question is, is uh, how can we deal with the power of use phenomena in order to maintain honorable businesses? Yeah. Um, abuse. So are you thinking about um, human trafficking? Is it that kind of abuse? You're no, talking thinking? about power abuse. Power abuse. Oh, power abuse. Is- uh, abusing their power. Ah, okay. Um, so thinking about, say, um, um, chief, chief executive officers in a business, or maybe um, the other executives of a business, um, or maybe, I mean, we could think about this in different ways. So you can think about it internally to a business. Um, do the leaders or the bosses of a business, are they abusing their power towards, say, their employees? That's one uh, way they might um, abuse power. Um, a different way, and maybe I'm not sure whether this is also what you were thinking of, but a different way we might think about it is, um, might a large company use its very size, its largeness to, um, uh, as leverage to move the market in various ways or to tilt things in its, um, in its own direction? Um, so th- those are two different ways. Maybe you're thinking about both, or maybe you're uh, concerned more with one or the other. Um, but I think um, in both cases, what, what we might the way the way the honorable business that I have described it might address that um, is first of all to say to make sure um, that remember that uh, one of the one aspect of uh, what I called honorable business was respecting other people's opt out option. Um, I think what um, one thing we have to make sure of, and this goes back to a role f- uh, for the state as far as I'm concerned, is that all people have an opt out option, which includes the um, the power and ability to leave. Um, and within a company, I think um, too often what we, th- what we restrict people's ability to leave or we restrict people's options um, to go somewhere else, or alternatively, we also place restrictions on new entrants into a market. So competitors that might try to, uh, that might want to start a business that competes with one that are, that's already entrenched or already in existence. Um, we place obstacles in their way, maybe because we want to, um, you know, we're engaging in cronyism to protect the, in- the entrenched business. Um, but we place obstacles in the way of people who want to try to do something new or maybe do something better. Um, so one way to limit the power of a, um, the power, the abusing of power within a company um, is to make sure that people have a variety of options. Um, and if people can leave, if your employees can leave, you might be, if you, if you are inclined to be an abusive um, uh, executive or owner of a company, um, if people have options, if they can go elsewhere, they will. 
Um, and that might not change your character. You might still be a, not a very good person. Um, but in that case, um, you are at least going to suffer from um, some cost. It'll cost you. You're going to lose good employees. You're going to lose employees. So it acts as a kind of disciplining factor. It's not a perfect factor. Um, and I would say, I recur to what I said earlier, which is that there are no perfect solutions, but the key would be to, um, to align incentives correctly so that it becomes, if you have the right institutions, then it can become in the business owner or business executive's interests. If that person wants to succeed, then they're going to have to treat their employees well. They're going to have to treat their customers well. They're going to have to treat their clients or potential clients and customers well. Um, so um, aligning those incentives and structuring um, and creating, structuring the institutions of society so that extraction is punished or prevented and cooperation is rewarded, um, that goes some way, it's not a perfect solution, but I think it can go some way and maybe more than we might initially think um, towards, um, towards encouraging mutually beneficial and cooperative um, interactions rather than extractive or abusive interactions. Okay, but the next question is from Noha. Um, Noha, please. Yes. Hi, hi, Professor. And thank Hello. you for your... Do you hear me? Yes, I can. Please go ahead. Um, I'm, I mean, the, uh, I have a comment and a question. The comment is the inequality. I agree on what you said, but you, you, if you make it the person per person is one thing. And if you look at the macro level and you see the percentage of extremely wealthy people, wealthy people versus um, uh, uh, the rest of the population, that is another consideration that is to be made. So how, how stark is the, um, uh, the inequality and the number of them, how many of them? This is something that I'm concerned about. But I agree that the real problem is in the poverty. And my question is, do you consider or do you propose that uh, honorable business can help uh, or address um, uh, the issue of poverty, can help um, uh, release people or relieve people from poverty? Uh, yes, thank you for your question. Not only do I think it can help, I think it is the antidote to poverty. Um, so um, as you may be, well be aware, um, you know, the proportion of people, the United Nations defines absolute poverty as living on approximately two United States dollars per person per day or less. Um, so they consider that to be um, the level of what they call absolute poverty. Um, in 1900, so 121 years ago, in 1900, um, the proportion of people living at that level or less the proportion of people on the planet um, was 90%, 90, 90%. Um, today, that uh, percentage is below 9%. It's about 8.5%. And that's despite the fact that we've added several billion more people now um, to the planet. So that is a, 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 an unprecedented um, rise out of poverty. We've never had that many people rise out of poverty um, in human history. How did that happen? Um, well, um, I, as I, do, I, I realize I only told a very quick story, but I think um, that the, um, the key to it is that more and more people uh, began to engage in what I called, and they didn't always call it this, but what I'm calling honorable business, which is they sought to benefit themselves only if at the same time and only by benefiting other people. So yes, I think that actually is the, um, the way that is ultimately going to be the antidote for poverty. Um, now, your other, the other part of your question was, what about inequality? Um, now, inequality is very tricky because it's hard. Um, you know, the, the statistics about inequality depend a great deal on what you measure and what you're looking at. Um, and inequalities in wealth are very hard to measure because we can't always know what people's wealth is. And there are many aspects of the wealth that people have that we can't quite measure or we just don't even know about. Um, so it's very difficult. And if you look only at income inequality, well, there are many wealthy people who receive no income or very little income, like Warren Buffett, for example, receives very little income. His wealth is in stock. That's the same thing with Jeff Bezos of Amazon, um, receives very little income because all of his wealth is in, uh, Am or a lot of his wealth is in Amazon stock. So it's very hard to measure. Um, nonetheless, what, um, uh, it look, if, if you, if, um, if you, with those uh, qualifications in mind, um, it looks like worldwide overall inequality between the poorest and the wealthiest um, may actually not be increasing, despite what you may have heard. Um, and one, just one quick anecdote that might um, at least make you think that's not um, that's not completely crazy is that 
if you think about earlier times in human history, um, so think about the pharaohs who were building the pyramids um, or, the, or Julius Caesar or the Roman, uh, the Roman emperors during the Roman empire, or maybe the, em the emperor during the Song dynasty in China. Um, so those people had in, uh, in relative terms to what Jeff Bezos has a lot less. On the other hand, the gap between the emperor and almost everybody else in their societies was enormous. Um, in fact, arguably in terms of actual purchasing power, the things that they could actually buy and procure for themselves, it was greater than what we have in the United uh, in the world today. Um, so in some ways, I think we're actually getting better than, uh, than we, have, uh, we have been in the past, but I would recur, and this would be the last point I'll make about this um, in the interest of time, but I would say, I still think as long as there are some people who are living at the level of absolute poverty or less, and there are still some people, about 650 million people worldwide, I think that should be our main cause of concern, not the inequality. So once everybody has risen out of that level of poverty, then I think we can turn our attention to um, whatever the various um, deleterious or negative effects of inequality might be. But I think first we have to pay attention to allowing people to rise out of poverty. Uh, last comment or question from uh, Muhammad Bohiji, if you could sort of unmute yourself, sir. Try to make it brief, please. The floor is yours, sir. Oh, maybe we lost that person. Uh, I, I don't know. He's not. Uh... Okay. Well, I guess he's not. Uh, he's not. Not sure if he's answering. Uh, Muhammad, are you interested to uh, ask your question? Okay, well, fine. Then we'll just uh, uh, James. I really want to thank you. I just I, I have one co one comment that is related. Where I kept thinking of one of our previous speakers was Colin Mayer from Oxford oh, yes. University. Yes, Colin has a book which is called Prosperity, which is very similar to the Greek term that you've used to sort of introduce fulfillment, uh, happiness, et yes. cetera, et cetera. Eudaimonia, yes. And he, he talks also about purpose, purpose of business. For him, a purpose of business is to, to make money solving problems of society or environment and not create problems. Yes. He's very, very clear about it. He's also very instrumental in something called the economy, economics of mutuality with uh, Bruno Roche, which is interesting, another speaker in our series. The concepts are extremely complementary. I mean, you could see it that it's, it's been developed by someone who's, yours are a business ethicist. Theirs are probably people who talk about financing and financing interventions, or they, they're more uh, uh, from, from, the, uh, from the purpose of business kind of, a, kind of a thing, not from a business ethics point of view. But it, it, it's amazing the similarity between them. Yeah. I really want to thank you for, for a very interesting discussion, very interesting uh, session and uh, hope to see you all. I mean, I, I thank the audience and hope to see you all uh, on next uh, Tuesday. No, next Tuesday, our speaker is Guelmi uh, La, La Fortune. He's, uh, he's going to talk about SDG progress and building forward better. Uh, this guy is one of the authors, one of the co authors of the SDG progress report for 2021. So it should be a very interesting uh, session. Uh, I just want to alert you that it's, it's in the morning. It's 11 o'clock. So it's not your typical 7 p.m. Uh, session. Sir, could we get the link in the chat if possible? I will, it will be sent to you, Josh. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. In the end, James, I really want to thank you. You and uh, it, it's been really a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for your time and uh, thank you for all your questions and attention, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and uh, please attune to the next session. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.